We are live. All right. Welcome back again. Last week, we were a little light on some of you, so I'm expecting the rest of you to carry the weight in the review. That's a cue, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you could apply that to many of the songs. True. Anybody else? Jarrett? Mm-hmm. Yes. First three, we talked about um, uh, blessings before you anticipate them. Uh, anything else? He um, recognized the enemies of God, his enemies specifically, couldn't do anything against him and, um, unless it was allowed. Anybody else? Psalms 22 is a transition away from what we have been talking about previously. And in fact, Psalms 22 may be one of the more important psalms. I mean, I guess all, all of them have value. All of them have a great level of importance. But Psalm 22 is specifically prophecy of Christ. And his suffering. This is maybe one of the more important songs that we're going to get to look at in our study. It says that it is to the chief musician upon Ijaleth Shahar, a psalm of David. Now, this is, means, as I, I think it was translated out to uh, Hind of the Morning or Morning Hind, which is... A deer, if you're not uh, if you're not aware of what a hind is, um, the AJ, I'm gonna need you to quit talking, son. Um, it is a. There are two different theories on who this was for. First of all, they they actually think that there may have been that this may have been something specific to. The type of music that the type of accompaniment that was supposed to go with this song. Uh, also, I have read that there may have been a a group like a singing group within David's uh, menagerie of musicians that were called the Morning Hind, um, uh, <laughs> which which would be unique. I, I I don't know how much I buy that one because it just seems like something someone made up, um, but. Um, uh, the other one, uh, I think, kind of speaks a little bit to what the psalm actually entails. Now, whether this actually has any bearing or meaning on it is, is another thing. But the, uh, that, uh, that Jesus' office often uh, uh, referred to or, or has that, that Jesus could be seen as a hind, as a deer, um, and that he was hunted for most of his days until his final slaying. Um, in fact... One of his earliest dangers to the the threaten the threatening of his life was at a very very the very very tender age of, of of two two or three I believe, and Herod goes and looks for uh, Jesus and slaughters a bunch of children in the process. So that brings us to the first verse of the chapter. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season am not silent. But thou art holy, O oh thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered, they trusted and were not confounded. The first verse of this psalm, if your mind does not immediately go to 
the gospel accountings of Jesus' crucifixion, I question your study of your your the amount that which you've studied the scriptures. Uh, Matthew twenty seven forty six basically reads this same verse over again and says, "In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani." That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, it is important, it is imperative, especially with Old Testament Scripture, that Jesus fulfill every aspect of it. Now, a lot of what's in this chapter happens, honestly, between, if, if we're just to take one gospel, uh, it, between, between about verse 30 of Matthew 27 to about verse... I think it's like about mid 40s there. All in that, set, basically from the time that he is on the tree, I think after he has spoken to the thief on the cross, to the point at when she says it is finished, a lot of this is addressed here. This chapter is all about Christ's agony and a specific type of agony. Most of this is about his separation from the Father. Most of this is about being cut off from himself, really. Uh, cut, uh, if Jesus was God in man, having Jehovah turn his back on him, a being that he had been in unity with for time immemorial, for eternity past, for that harmony, the, the, if, if, if you were to take the Godhead as musical notes and say that they were a, 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 a three-strike chord on a piano, never one without the other, right. that separation is much of what this... Now, it does talk a lot about physical pain as well, but specifically in these first four verses that we look at, uh, it is about this grief. Grief compounded by separation, compounded by enormous physical and spiritual pain. Verse 2, he says, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not in the night season, and in the night season, and am not silent. Jesus, <clears throat> maybe, well, definitely, for the first time in his life, experience is something that I think we become well too acquainted with, and that is praying to God, but being so separated from Him that you don't hear from Him. A state that we, at times, revel in, because it is, it is easier for us to fulfill the, the pleasures of the flesh than to stay attuned to God to the point of being able to be heard. And Jesus, for the first time, experiences Now, we have all been in situations where we're feeling a lot of emotional anguish, uh, perhaps physical anguish, and we call out for God and He does not hear. You know, uh, the one of, uh, in addition to the fulfillment of, of all the scriptures, one of the greatest gifts that we have in Christ is that we know that He understands everything we've been through, including offering up prayer and getting no answer in return. Or seemingly no answer. Verse 3 says, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Now, verse 3 is him giving a potential explanation for why God doesn't hear him. And it is not that God is wrong. It is not that God has failed. It is not that God is, doing, uh, is, 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 is being intentionally cruel to us. But he has a holy and a perfect plan. And you, perhaps in your grief, in your pain, in your suffering, in your emotional turmoil, whatever it may be, you are fulfilling God's plan. That is exactly what Jesus was going through. It was part of the plan for Jesus to suffer this. We're going to be talking a little bit in a moment about the garden and some stuff he went through in the Garden of Eden. Um, not the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane, rather. Um, and Jesus was fully aware that all this was coming. 
he was aware that in a few short hours he would be experiencing more pain and more anguish than any human being would ever be able to endure. That any being would ever be able to live through. But, and I think this is what you get after he leaves the Garden of Gethsemane, the acceptance that's there is that God's answer to that was, you know the plan. You know what you must do. And I even think in this moment where he cries out, why have you forsaken me? A spiritual and anguish that he was going through, it always went back to the plan. It always went back to, he didn't, the why was redundant. Why hast thou forsaken me? It was not as if Jesus didn't know. It's not as if Jesus wasn't aware. It was more of a, an exclamation than anything else. Our fathers trusted thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. Jesus, the psalmist, points out, and potentially, uh, there's, there's no confirmation from the gospel, potentially Jesus also could have prayed this, that the children of Israel, they suffered quite a bit, that, but they trusted in the Lord, and the Lord would deliver them. And this is all through the Old Testament. Something bad happens. Israel gets an upheaval. They, they run back to God wishing He'll help them. And then God says, okay, you're finally where you need to be. I'll deliver you from what's going on. And, and, and Jesus, in this moment of forsakenness, He's calling to. He's trying to call to God's mind. Hey, th this is this is this is how we've always done things. When we're in trouble, my fathers, my forefathers, and again, Jesus was just as much man as he was as he was God. He was he was he was he was both inside the same person, and his lineage was David. He said, oh my, I, I can look back to the scriptures and tell you that when they're in trouble, they called to you, they trusted you, and you came and helped them. Now help me. Help me. In this moment, they cried unto thee, and they were delivered. They trusted thee, and they were not confounded. This verse almost almost says, "You, you have helped so many other people in their times of need." Jesus Himself had helped so many people in those times. How many lepers had come to him? I, leprosy cannot be an easy disease to deal with. Now, I'm sure there's not a lot of pain because if, as, as, I, as, I, as best as I know, they lose nerve feeling before those, but it, it's not, not a pleasant disease to live through. Blindness is not, a, is, is not a pleasant affliction to have to deal with for your whole life. All those cripples... You know, there are certain forms of being crippled that they're, they're an intense joint pain and muscular pain all the time. None of those things can be... And, 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 and the Old Testament is full of miracles of people getting, getting healed and getting helped and receiving help from God. And all through the New Testament of Jesus' ministry, He helps and He, and he heals and He brings... And He's saying, we've, we as God... I, I am, as God, have gone, and we've helped all these people. Why can't I receive any help? Why in this utter moment of distress can I not be helped? All of this contained within, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is calling upon the promises of the Scripture. But also, there's an example here for us. When we, when we go to God in prayer, especially for aid, calling upon the promises of God is not a bad thing. It, 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 you can almost say, well, it, 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 if, you, if you are to do that, it almost sounds like what you're, you're trying to preempt God. No, but God makes covenants. He makes, there, there are contracts throughout all of Scripture. It goes, if you do this, then I will... X, Y, and Z. And if you honestly can claim, I have done this, now where's the X, Y, and Z that you promised? God is obligated not by you, but by His own word to fulfill His part of the... That, that, that is how that works. And Jesus was doing the very same thing. He said, I, I've done everything right. I lived perfectly for so long. 
And yet here I am. And then we get to verse 6, and this is the reason why he can receive no help. I, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Jesus compares himself in this prophecy as a worm. Now, all of us are comparable to worms. Mankind are a filthy, fallen race, not worthy of a glance of the Savior's eyes. But it goes even deeper than that. He says, I am a worm and no man. What a fall. You, you talk about, especially before the, the sins of all of us were laid upon him, and God is, and Jehovah God is forced to just, I can't look at that anymore, and turn away from him. Jesus goes from, I mean, you can look in Exodus, from I am, capital I, capital A-M, to I am a worm. And even worse than a worm, I'm not even a man. There are certain benefits that come with humanity, if you will. There are certain, and and specifically even as a Jew, there were certain promised benefits of being a Jewish human in this time. His fall and the sin placed upon him, your sin placed upon him, brought him to a place. So, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a sidewalk that runs by the barber shop there. And in the summertime, when it's so hot, a worm will get up on that, that sidewalk and they will writhe in agony. Right now, it's so wet, the worms are coming out of the ground because they can't breathe in the soil. So the, they'll, they'll, they'll rise to the top and they'll find a place. And, and even, on, even on, a, on a wet sidewalk where they're just struggling for air, they writhe and they turn in agony. And Jesus is comparing, to, 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 and, and to step upon a worm, what, what do we use worms for? We use worms for composting. We use worms for fishing lure. When you pinch off a night crawler, does it scream? Does it even pass your mind what you're doing to him? No. Jesus was comparing himself to the lowest of the... He he put himself beneath you. All the while in this downtrodden and, 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 and really could be stepped on and no one would care place that he was in. And then he finds himself lower than the creature that he created. Not even granted the benefits of life. That, we, that even the lost are granted those benefits of. You know, the rain, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Certain things that just come with being human. And he was not even granted. Why did God turn on him? Because he wasn't worthy to receive the blessings that he was, that he was asking for. And it's not, well, uh, Jesus is worthy. Of course he was. But at that moment, with your sin and with my sin and with your sin, laid on his head, he was worthy of nothing. He was in the same place. He, he was as, as, as fall, experiencing as the fallenness of our very natures all at once. They, see, uh, they all see me, uh, they all see me, uh, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he, tr- he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Now, if you, uh, uh, verse, the end of verse 6, and despised of the people, um, and then verses 7 and 8, um, bring to us another kind of rejection. He's rejected of the Father. He's rejected of Jehovah. There's no, there was, there, as, as long as our sin lay upon him, there was no way of God turning back to him. Who else could aid him in this moment but his people, the people he is right, rightfully king of by birth, by being their God, by being the prophesied Messiah? Turn to the Jews. What do they say? Well, 
Matthew 27, 42 through 43 says, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, whom he should be, and I will believe the rightful king. Oh, oh no. Uh, 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 he trusted in God, let him deliver him now if, if, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The rejection here of he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him is echoed by the Jews there on, and I, the, some of the people that attended Christ's crucifixion probably knew exactly what they were saying as they mocked him. They may have even quoted Psalm 22 as they as Caiaphas and some of the high priests railed at him from the ground from which they stood. He turns to the Jews, the people that should be his people, the people that, and we're going to get to this in just a moment, the people that he told the, the woman from Canaan that, I come to, 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 for Israel. I'm not going to cast crumbs before, the, I'm not going to cast the children's meat before the dogs. That, that's us, by the way. He looks to them, and they reject him. Another back slammed on his face. Another, and, and this is not just, well, yeah, of course the high priest and them. He, he, he should not be able to look for them. Help. No, it's not just them. There were other Jews there that should have stood with him. Peter should, no, Peter swear that he would stand, stood, stand with him. And before the cock crew, he denied him thrice. Yeah. Peter was, a, was definitely a Jew. And if you listen to Brother Larry's sermon this morning, he even called out that Peter was so Jew that he thought that maybe some Judaism should find its way back into Christianity. The Jews rejected him. John, the one who laid his head on his breast, the one that was supposed to be the most, one of the most beloved of the disciples, where was he? He got closer than Peter. I don't see John standing up and say, Hey, y'all don't need to be doing this and trying to wrestle the hammer free from the Romans' hands. Where's that happening? They all rejected him. All of them. But thou art he... That took me out of the womb, thou didst make us, thou didst make me hope when I was laid upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Now, verses nine through eleven, they seem almost out of place, but it's another cry for help and another call to God to remember how. He had aided Christ in the past, how he had aided others in the past. He says that he had been, um, that uh, thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast, and I was cast, I was cast upon thee from the womb. Jesus' faith in God's protection shielded him as an infant, where Jesus, in spirit, could have defended himself, but physically, a baby does have has no ability to defend themselves. And so he was completely cast upon Jehovah's ability to protect him. And specifically, and this links to what we just talked about, about the rejection from the Jews, specifically from Jews that wanted to kill him. Jesus' first threat, as we stated the first of the Christ, was Herod, was a king of the Jews. And he was calling to mind, hey, these people all around me, they're rejecting me. Where's the help that you sent me when I was a child? Where was the, where was the vision to tell Joseph and Mary to leave and get out of Dodge before bad things happen? Before the slaughter of hundreds of infants and, and babies took place. pitiful cry of, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Loneliness upon the cross. 
Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They have gaped upon me with their mouths as ravening and roaring lions. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Now, verses 12, 16, and 20 start referring to a different threat. 16, we'll read it out of sequence with the rest of it when we go through. Uh, but uh, 16 says, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Verses 20, Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Who are the dogs? Those are the Gentiles. Verse uh, um, Matthew 20, uh, 15, 22 through 17 says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the, uh, of the coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, uh, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not yet... Uh, the uh, uh, it is not not meet that the to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. He said, "Truth, Lord." Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Now this is Jesus making a direct correlation between two things: the term "dogs" and the and the Gentiles. The dogs mentioned here in Psalms are you. So not only is he rejected of his father. Not only is he rejected of the Jews, he is rejected of the Gentiles. Not a soul on this planet is free from the guilt of the rejection of the Messiah. Not a person. Not a one. Verse 16, I think, very specifically says who the dogs are. If you if, if you're, think that I'm stretching a little bit by calling back to the verses in Matthew because it says, they ha- pierced my hands and my feet. That's That was the act of the Romans. The Romans did that. They uh, And then verse 14, I'm poured out like water. All my vo- bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me unto... Uh, unto the dust of death. Jesus, at this point in the crucifixion, was running out of steam, physically. It is simply His will that kept Him going for the many hours He hung on the cross. If you catalog the list of injuries that Jesus took on the road to Calvary, many of them should have killed Him. He took some blows to the head that probably should have rendered him unconscious, if not with a serious concussion. He was whipped mercilessly. He was then beaten, and then he was forced to carry all of this while bleeding out all the way up the hill while he had a crown of thorns plaited upon his head, head bleeding out, and then he was nailed to a cross, probably severed several arteries and veins on the way in with that stuff. He should have bled out very quickly after being put on that cross. At the very least, the loss of oxygen from holding himself up on the cross by his broken wrists and ankles should have rendered him dead. It was simply his will and his dedication to the plan set forth that kept him alive. Because here, he says, My strength is dried up like a posture. He had no physicality left to give. He talks about his tongue clinging to his jaw, and I believe this could be a reference to John uh, 19, 28-30. After this, Jesus, knowing all things were accomplished, that the Scripture uh, might be fulfilled, uh, saith, I thirst. Now there was a vessel of vinegar, and they uh, filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it on a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and bowed his head, and gave up the ghost completely and totally spent in the work that he had to do for you and me.
We've read verse 16. Verse 17, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. This verse is a little odd because of the way that it's structured. Now, there's two different ways that I have heard this saying, that the tell is a, is a counting, that, that him, I tell my bones, that you, he, was, he was counting his injuries as he hung on the cross, that he was, he was every pain that he was experiencing, he could enumerate them, and he was experiencing... It. You know, at some point with pain... On a human, your mind starts just kind of checking out um, uh, when you go into shock and stuff. And and if this is what this verse means, and there's two different ways to look at this, both neither one of them are very good. But if this is the way, that means that Jesus didn't have the option of shock. He just kept enduring pain. He just kept experiencing it over and over and over. Now, um, the other one is that his positioning on the cross was as such, and as so, Jesus wasn't a handsome dude. I think I actually think Jesus was probably pretty strong because he was a carpenter, and carpenters in ancient times were stout, <laughs> were stout people. Um, but uh, Jesus also spent three and a half years preaching and not eating or staying anywhere very much, and it was very likely by the time that we get to his crucifixion that Jesus was probably pretty lean, um, probably pretty thin, um, and that his positioning on his cross, and because they took his garments, that he was completely exposed, and you could count his bones in his body, and that this that that this that says that um, I, I tell all my bones that it was an, kind of an exposure thing, and then because it goes on further and says they look and stare upon me, so this was shame. The Bible is very clear about nakedness. If you look at our articles of the faith on the website, it's basically a summation of the lesson that I taught in here on nakedness, and God doesn't like it. <laughs> is is essentially is essentially the short the short answer of that, um, and um, Jesus was exposed in every way. Why did Adam and Eve in the garden run from the voice of God? Shame. They knew they were naked. The earliest form of shame was. I don't want you to see all the bits. I don't want you to see everything that I saw. And the one of the crowning shames and suffering of the cross was his complete and full exposure before the priests, before the Jews, before the Romans, before his friends, before his mom. There on the cross. How, mu- how many of you would volunteer to strip down naked in front of everybody in this room and your parents if they were sitting in here? I, I don't. I would. I would dare say not a single person would raise their hand for the shame of that moment. So on top of the loneliness, the mental anguish, the spiritual anguish, then you just have the people that gawked at his form. They part my garments among them and do cast lots upon my vesture. Verse 18 is a direct reference to the acts the Roman soldiers took while he died upon the tree. Luke 23 verse 34 uh, displays the forgiveness of Jesus even in the moment during uh, uh, during this act. He says, um, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots this was a moment uh, another moment of shame this is degradation you're not even in the ground yet and people are fighting like rabid dogs over a piece of meat um you're not even it, it, it would be as if a loved one was passing away and this happens, sadly enough. A loved one was passing away, and the relatives are already trying to divide what's left of their estate. That's, there's, no, there's no honor there. There's no, um, there's no respect there. 
Jesus was completely shamed and abused and rejected repeatedly and repeatedly on the cross. We will leave it at verse 18 and wrap up the rest of the chapter on next week. Are there any questions or comments on this first part of Psalm 22? Brother Jarrett. Yeah. I meant to bring this up, but I didn't because I was in the middle of something else. But I, I of all the things that Jesus has Jesus bore, I have not experienced any of it except for bones out of joint. And let me tell you, it is excruciating. It is every bit as bad as you can imagine it is. And until the bone goes back into joint, it continues to hurt. And there's no way of not doing it. Right now, I can almost not even think about it. It makes me sweat thinking about dislocating a joint. Brother Larry can tell you a little bit about dislocating a joint. It hurts. And there is a lot of evidence to believe that not one, but probably multiple of Christ's joints were out of. It's probably his shoulders and his hips at least, if not more. Well, and... He had to pull on those dislocated joints to get air to stay up. But again, by the time he was on the cross, it was not much more than his desire to finish the plan of God for you that kept him alive because there was nothing left physically. Anything else? He had to endure he had to endure a punishment worthy of paying that price. Yeah. That's how his, his one death is able to pay for an infinite number of human deaths. As the song says, he suffered it all because he loves me. Those that are that are lost, I don't know what your spiritual eternal home is there's one that does I would seek him while he may be found because peradventure as Abraham said he could have done all this for you I have no way of saying yea or nay only he knows any other questions or comments before we wrap up? Good class. Have a great week. We will pick up with the latter half of this chapter in the following week. Thank you.